зовут меня Дмитрий Николаевич Новиков, я доцент кафедры английского языка номер один в ГИМО. Сегодня этот день проведу с вами я в качестве модератора, а завтра передам в раздел правления Светлане Андреевне Песиной. У нас с вами получается примерно 10 минут на доклад, на презентацию, да, потому что всего 100, 160 минут где-то у нас, да, и чтобы все успели представить самые интересные моменты вашей презентации, пожалуйста, следите за временем. На всякий случай на восьмой минуте вам будет помогать наш технический секретарь Татьяна Николаевна. Да, пожалуйста, принимайте это во внимание. А наша с вами секция сопровождается синхронным переводом. Да, поэтому, если кто-то захочет послушать перевод, да, или э, просто насладиться английским языком, э, то у вас есть возможность нажать на кнопочку «Перевод» на панели инструментов и выбрать нужный канал. Э, далее. Очень большая просьба, если вы не выступаете, то отключите, пожалуйста, ваш э, звук микрофона, да, вот, и уже гораздо лучше стало слышно, но при этом большая просьба для того, чтобы сохранить атмосферу присутствия, оставлять включенный камеру, потому что докладчикам сложно говорить с темнотой, да, как вы, наверное, сами поняли уже во время занятий за прошедшие месяцы. Если у вас будут какие-то вопросы к докладчику, а на все, конечно, мы не сможем ответить из-за того, что времени не так много, вы, пожалуйста, пишите их в чат. Мы заодно сделали Google документ с табличкой для вопросов, и мы можем туда эти вопросы копировать для того, чтобы вы потом уже могли оставить ваши обстоятельные ответы на них. Ну и либо во время сессии нетворкинг могли как-то тоже друг с другом лично поговорить. Ну вот, пожалуй, и все. Мы с вами начнем с общих вопросов, касающихся организации знания. Затем перейдем к тому, какое воздействие оказало и, возможно, продолжает оказывать на единицы, различные единицы языков текущая пандемия. Далее рассмотрим актуальные вопросы описания картины мира различных языковых сообществ. А уже завтра, во второй день работы, уделим внимание когнитивно-коммуникативным аспектам различных лексико-семантических и грамматических единиц, а также вопросам прагматики коммуникации. Ну, если, в принципе, все понятно, то мы можем приступать к работе, и я приступаю к оглашению, вернее, да, оглашаю первого нашего докладчика, это Ольга Игоревна Апарина, с презентацией о представлении знаний в новой парадигме на основании медиадискурса. Скажите, пожалуйста, да, Ольга Игоревна. Вы видите мою видеопрезентацию? Пока что нет. Вы нажмите демонстрацию экрана. Сейчас, тогда. А сейчас? А тоже пока нет. Татьяна Николаевна, у нас включен общий доступ к демонстрации экрана. Да, да обязательно. Ага. Так. Да. Попробуйте еще раз. Так, я нажимаю на демонстрацию экрана. Угу. 
у меня есть. Сейчас, может быть, появится некоторое время. Появилось? Нет, не видно. Пока нет. Пока нет, уважаемые коллеги, если кого-то нет. And gentlemen, dear colleagues, if you are unable to share the screen, please send your presentation to Татьяна Яблокова to the email address. Uh, I, I, I'll send my email to the chat. Ольга Игоревна. Shall we listen to the second speaker? Then the floor is given to our second speaker. Svetlana Leonidovna Kliminskaya, Gimo University, Russia. The topic of her presentation is the concept of sustainable development, semantic structure and cognitive features. So cognitive specifics of semantic structure of sustainable development. Uh, dear participants, uh, uh, dear organizers, I'd like to thank you for the floor, for the opportunity to talk here. And I'm going to talk about the cognitive specifics of the semantic structure of the concept of de sustainable development. The concept was uh, uh, formed, uh, was introduced to life a hundred years ago by our Russian scientist Vernadsky. That was his view on the social uh, on social processes, how they are developed. He came up with uh, economic and environmental problems that should be looked into. Uh, then the concept uh, was evolved and uh, it uh, addressed new problems and this concept of uh, sustainable development became much broader. It uh, really have many aspects. It has various interpretations in different cultures. All this uh, propped up the development of the sustainable development discourse. It includes several interactive, interconnected uh, components, which are shown on the fly slide. It uh, sometimes depends, it depends on lexical aspects. Uh, it, uh, so we single out the semantic basis it's, uh, and the core of the semantic basis of the concept. They reflect the basic phenomena related to this uh, area. The, the, system, the hierarchical uh, links are also shown here and institutional sub-discourses uh, interact very closely, which uh, shows the interaction of social institutions. And the result is the formation of hybrid entities, which are integrated into the discourse that can function uh, along the lines of several sub-discourses. For example, uh, we can uh, single out several uh, structures, uh, re renewable, marketing, etc. We can also show the conceptual structure of this discourse on the slide. Uh, something has happened to connection. Светлана Леонидовна, вы нас слышите? Светлана Леонидовна, can you hear us?
Так, похоже, что Светлана Леонидовна исчезла. А, да, Светлана Леонидовна... Нет, она Хотя есть. Она, она есть, есть, есть да, она в участниках она есть, да. В участниках да. есть, но совершенно не видно. А, так, а, ну что же тогда, может быть... Окей, okay, so what shall we do now? Maybe we'll go back to Olga Igorevna. Olga Igorevna, are you with us? Yes, I'm okay. I have sent a presentation. So, Tatiana Nikolaevna, can you help with the demonstration of the presentation? Okay, can you see me? Can you see my presentation okay so 10 minutes for this presentation representation of knowledge in a new paradigm on the basis of media discourse so what do we mean by the notion of knowledge many movements uh, paradigms show that people focus not only on knowledge uh, itself but on the way of its formation so the, there is a, an aspiration to understand how the information is perceived processed and understand understood and it has been done by many uh, domains of knowledge uh, 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 many sciences and research studies the uh, modern linguistics uh, is anthropocentric, as we know. That's why if we speak about the theoretical framework, we can say that the focus is the language personality as uh, a subject of cognition. And I present uh, uh, the <coughs> uh, quotation from Tatiana Komova, who treats the language personality as a subject of knowledge, uh, who depends on three levels of cognition, empiric, notional, and interpretational knowledge. Uh, how we understand the knowledge. Uh, we can give a definition from the science philosophy academ academic rule. It's the result of the process of cognition expressed in language or through language forms. Another theory uh, I'm based on the, is the theory of cognitive development by Piaget, who studied the cognitive development of a child. And while studying the processes of cognition, uh, it, this theory can be used. This, there are three models of accumulation of knowledge in this theory, assimilation, accommodation, and uh, equilibrium. Assimilation means the inclusion of new information, accommodation new schemes, the creation of new schemes on the basis of the existent and equilibrium is the, the uh, appearance, emergence of a new worldview. So what are the goals of my research? The study of lexical units that uh, name uh, cognitive processes to identify the trends in transformation of their meanings, uh, which reflect uh, general dimension in perception of the phenomena of knowledge. And uh, the material are the articles of English and American newspapers uh, on coronavirus from uh, The Guardian, The New York Times, why we want to do this research. Uh, because uh, it's uh, it's just fear of my uh, research knowledge and 
there are some linguistic factors related to it. The, the situation, the development, the international situation of 2020-2021. So we studied the lexical units that relate to consciousness. The first one is knowledge and the verb know, to know. First of all, we made a statistical analysis and it turned out that the lexical unit knowledge is, does not, uh, is not of frequent usage. Just once in one article and two times in, in another article. And the context is presented here on the slide. How do they uh, replace this? With what uh, units do they replace? Knowledge now is replaced by learn, see, to be aware, feel, awareness is starting to improve, aware. And the last one to find out. Actually, it's quite often replaces the lexical unit to know. It means that uh, 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 there is an uncertainty and uh, uh, in uh, the information uh, whether it's true or not, because knowledge and know is something that is uh, has proven is really true. It's really uh, proven by the situation. Another lexical unit we've uh, studied is information. It's used in uh, two, three times in most articles. Usually it's used in the beginning and when it refers to citations, to sources believe in information and when the if they talk about a certain uh, certain factors that illustrate the uncertainty of situations and the most frequent uh, word is data the frequency is from five to ten fact, news, and data. So these are the most frequent lexical units. And you, uh, the material we've uh, studied are news articles and items. They present new information, news. And the courses give information new information for the readers and they give uh, a certain and uh, made make a certain analysis and also uh, they, this is uh, supported by empirical data so the inf the frequency is explained by the a precision of these words and uh, if computer sources uh, are sources of information and means of communication the there is a rise in uncertainty and also sometimes uh, uh, show or analyze facts which are both proven and unproven. So many articles contain, even in the titles, a ref reference to a, a site, uh, to source, and they say claim, state, say. And they also use uh, the word scientists. Scientists are concerned, etc. Found some cases. So the frequency is quite uh, high from five to six. And also, as a referral, they use the verb think and analyze. 
It means that uh, scientists have special powers in processing the information and they are in a privileged position uh, with regards to the assessment of the information. And of course, uh, all these uh, uh, words used by the language can uh, are explained by the situation related to the pandemic. Olga Igorevna, thank you very much. Shortly formulate what is knowledge about the modern stage, what would you say about it? From my point of view, it depends on lexics. Knowledge is a something known and certain, and what media discourse is being prevailed by empiric knowledge, specific data which hasn't been proved yet so data from computer science science facts etc thank you very much thank you i would like to remind you that you can send your questions in the chat or add it to the table and we have a link to that table can we continue? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I actually finished my presentation and I just, after that, I, so we can give you five more minutes. But when did I uh, ended my presentation? What did you hear? All right. Maybe you will shortly sum up your presentation. Um, so yeah, we were discussing a complex discourse, sustainable development, the different micro and structures have been formed on, uh, on its basis and sub discourses interact with each other. So in the end, we have hybrid concepts that formulate macro structures, the conceptions of sustainable development. We can see that we have different thematical changes and cognitive transformations as well that I stated. So there's a cognitive hybridization, modal changes categorization, conversion. Uh, moreover, besides these changes, we can see some indirect communication and interaction between two discourses, or in three discourses. It's a very complex and multi-layered transformation. And we will further work on this field of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. How sustainable, from your point of view, is this development? Um, well, that, that's very discursive and topical issue in different representatives of different cultures really tackle this issue differently and if you want to find a solution to the, the problem you have to you have to know how to speak to different cultures and this tendency is very vivid so the idea is quite sustainable and i hope there will be some results and now we well, see how good our knowledge is and how sustainable development 
was affected by this pandemic situation. And uh, Natalia Kirillovna Ivanova will now take the floor and she will tell us about modern medical technology during the COVID-19 pandemic. Natalia Kirillovna, are you with us? We have some technical issues with, with Ivanova Natalia Kirillovna on this presentation. Then probably we can give the floor to Project Kovanadezhda Stanislavovna and Project Kovanadezhda Stanislavovna and their presentation on modern medical terminology. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, our presentation will be dedicated to uh, modern medical terminology during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the COVID-19 pandemic being quite well described and the further reaction to this pandemic was quite different from unacceptable to no protocol, safety measures complacent. And professional medical help is now a topical issue. TV and media coverage of the pandemic, as well as creation of some technical tools to prevent severe cases of the COVID-19 infection uh, been the symbols of this pandemic. And the Finland University of Languages uh, included COVID-19 and face mask uh, into the list of most used words of 2020. So new tools inside virusology are being developed because we need to further describe the infection and in order to fight it and prevent it. Uh, but also need unification and start standardization of terminology inside the international community in order to have fruitful dialogue on measures to prevent COVID-19. Uh, the goal of our presentation is to describe the complex and multi-layered medical terminological system. We've studied more than 200 articles and texts. We created 1,043 terminolo terminological units and studied text word divided into two categories the science, the popular scientific texts and scientific articles published in specialized medical magazines. And we also divided terminological units into two categories, one being the tools to describe the infection and the other one is the way to describe the infection itself and the terminological system is based on the core term immunity. So we describe how the immune system is being shattered by the infection and what we can do to recover it and strengthen it. Although COVID-19 infection and terms that are used to describe it correlate with other terms in the scientific discourse. The terminological system has some universal characteristics. It doesn't have homonymous forms and emotional uh, terms as well. 
and terms that you use to describe the COVID-19 pandemic are usually hybrids. They are created by adding several uh, words together. The rate of English language words is quite low because um, we have to really describe the effects of the pandemic to a very broad audience. And English terms are more frequently used in media because many scientific articles are being used in scientific publications. Uh, another factor of English terms being used is the generification of the discourse because many descriptive terms originated in the English language. So we were able to create a matrix of these borrowed terms. And those borrowings are very extensive because of frequency of words being borrowed and extensivity of the language transfer can be traced in several uh, thematical um, fields. But nomination and its frequency doesn't mean uh, that people from different cultures will understand them clearly. We still have a lot of work to describe the situation more clearly and, and specify it. Epidemics is described by the Finnish equivalent of the word. And also other languages are being used as the source material for linguistic borrowings, for example, Latin language. And lingua, linguistic transfer, terms from different fields are being appropriated by a scientific field. The mask term is an example of international um, word or term because this word is present in different linguistic systems in the Finnish language. We have this word as well, but some international words replace national ones. For example, in Finland, three words were used to describe face masks. But during the pandemic, only one word left. And that word is Tafsamaske, which describes the uh, surgeon's mask, which is used uh, the most during the pandemic. Even if these words are synonymous, they consolidate into one composite lexical unit in order not to have some differences. Denomination is based on non-linguistic non-linguistic factors. Sanitizer in English is Kassadesi, and that is a composite linguistic unit, which is based on two different um, words. Any thematic group has its own linguistic units, and it's not an enclosed system. And as well as the virus itself mutates, so does the thematic group of words. So we, we've seen that the uh, that several synonymous word groups connected with other um, viruses and um, infections now become more homogenous. 
while describing the COVID-19 pandemic, there are some um, synonymistic words. Doublets become synonymous as well. And the broad audience expressed the, uh, the favor to more um, international and understandable uh, terms. Professional oriented words show that they are being digested. Clearly, and terminological systems are very dense, dense information-wise, and there are lots of words in Finland that are that have more clear meaning to people inside the country. But scientific so this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm sorry, my microphone was silent. Some participants have their microphone live. I ask those who have their microphones live, turn them off. These tendencies and processes of term creation, are they um, in the same field as other um, fields of terminology. They are, but um, certainly people in Finland use national words more because they are used to them. Thank you very much. And now, I would like to ask Natalia Kirillovna to take the floor. I would like to draw the attention of our participants to talk a bit slower because we have simultaneous interpreting and it's very difficult to interpret fast paced um, presentations and some vital pieces of information might, might be lost in translation. The floor is yours. And we now begin the presentation. Natalia Kirillin, you have 10 minutes, and the floor is yours. I will try my best to, to do that. And I also congratulate you with the English Language Day. And my presentation is dedicated to COVID-19 English reflection on the English language material based on the language English material. And COVID-19 was very was a very diff difficult situation for the United States and the problem that we try linguistically to dissect is very is a very topical one and several experts have published uh, materials on COVID-19 based on Russian, 
in English languages alike. So, so the pandemic was a very interesting field of knowledge for language experts. And it, it is a very fruitful field to analyze. So we tried to create a certain picture of the pandemic. I will present uh, the fraction work that has been done different colleagues and the American with the American English. But there are also some discoveries based on English and British English. And we would like to dissect the process of creation of different terms during the pandemic. We use certain linguistic methods, for example, discourse analysis. And synonymic analysis as well. We also, uh, well, we've already heard some work on the Finnish language. So the chain of knowledge is quite simple and understandable. A certain phenomena. And, and then there is linguistic reaction, information of a linguistic matrix, and then experts try to discover something during that phenomenon occurring. So we used the internet version of the Merriam-Webster dictionary. And uh, this um, dictionary is being updated at a rapid pace. And um, the trend inquiries are being, are being analyzed in our work. And the dictionary itself up updates its core base with those queries and it tries to explain new words and new meanings to um, the users. But this sources describe only the first stage of the new terminological matrix. So the Corpus includes more than 200 linguistic units, and we've divided them into several topics. The first one is the naming of a virus. And this group includes medical and biological abbreviations uh, that were previously used only in the scientific sphere. For example, COV, SARS, COV, SARS, COV2, etc. Only after that, uh, the COVID 19 abbreviation was created. And that abbreviation means coronavirus infectious disease 2019. And it is also a very interesting title because Corona originates in the Greek language. And this word described the um, sun's Corona that occurs during the eclipse. But Corona is being interpreted as a um, boiled down 
a, sim a simpler version of the original term. And these spikes around the virus are being called um, corona and spike. There was also a certain period of time when COVID-19 infection was called as novel or novel COVID, but um, that term uh, was, was briefly substituted by uh, China virus and then by COVID-19 virus once again. And there is a different group of terms which describes uh, counter pandemic measures and some restrictive measures in order to prevent the spread of the virus. And there are terminological units that were previously used in the medical community to describe other infectious diseases as well as new uh, terms that try to describe and explain uh, the situation that we have now. Also, there is a subgroup of words which meanings were brought up during the pandemic. Furlough is a special word when it comes to describe uh, the new COVID-19 infection. This word is a typical example of so the word changed its original meaning. Oh, so these are lexical unit of a different uh, lexical stylistic register. And in May 2020, the uh, request to, for a definition has grown considerably. And lexicographers explained it as uh, uh, showing that furlough is not a layoff and layoff uh, becomes a synonym of a furlough. But if we look into the Anglo-Russian dictionary by Müller, we'll see that there is a, a, di a different uh, difference between these two words. Furlough is just the military leave. Oh. So, and it's used in the military domain. Another uh, very frequent lexical unit, lockdown. It is uh, transformed from a verb into a noun. And uh, new colloquial meanings have emerged. <clears throat> For example, here you can see the, an example of a usage of this word. And the next slide shows that sometimes a well-known a celebrity, for example, Anthony Fauci, is a director of the Institute, uh, Medical Institute, also managed to uh, launch new words. They are actually neologisms. Sometimes they were not understood by uh, the recipients, by the people, the public at large. And there were many <coughs> requests to find out the meaning of the word. So you can see here, hunker down means to hide, hide out, to find shelter. That's in American English. and. But it's a uh, dictionary meaning. Another 
important lexical unit face mask. First, the collocation was a medical mask. Then it was replaced by a shorter version face mask. And as you can see, that the first stage shows that at first uh, masks were used only by medical personnel, while bandanas uh, and other devices were used by ordinary people. Uh, uh, medical uh, lexical units are uh, quite widespread, and not all of uh, political figures, public figures, uh, use it in uh, correctly, for example, as Donald Trump used the word disinfectant, because he called uh, for uh, to call on people to uh, get treatment with a disinfectant. Other names of medical preparations of medicines, for example, Rams Devere. It was a very uh, uh, frequently used model of word formation. So the precedent names. Pangloss, that is a protagonist of Voltaire's novel, Candide. So it's a precedent name and it gives rise to an adjective panglossian. It's a metaphoric way of usage, which me means public reassurance and dismissiveness. So we have seen that the main uh, lexical unit relates to the notion of survival. And to give you some precedent situations in any social uh, field or area or knowledge domain, there are one's own ways of uh, eliciting the sense and uh, expressing it through the language means. So you can, this slide shows the precedent situations. For example, the assessment of life loss, war in Vietnam, 9-11, economic loss, uh, Great Depression. And my conclusions are, there are two basic language principles of redundancy and uh, economy of efforts. And everybody knows about it there is lexical redundancy and the author usually uses resorts to redundancy and uh, it, the role of uh, participants of the media communication communicate situation is very important because each of the participants uh, makes his her own contribution to a communicative situation. So um, our studies are interdisciplinary as uh, uh, we uh, are based on many areas of research. Unfortunately, the uh, quality of connection was not very good, but slides helped us to uh, be in the know what you were saying, to follow what you were saying. So the uh, the problems of lexical derivation, uh, policy synonym, what is the basis for polysemy? What do you think is the basis for polysemy? Okay, I can see that you can't hear me. So 
will uh, put down, write down this question in the chart, in the table. Now the floor is given to Evgenia Popova, Mos Moscow Linguistic University. Her topic is neologisms of the coronavirus era in Spanish, sources of cultural specificity. I hope that you can see well my presentation. You can hear me also well. So I'd like, first of all, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for a chance to talk here. It's my fourth uh, conference, so I'm, I'm very glad to be here today. So new words, uh, neologies in Spanish. In 2020, uh, 2020 saw a great rise of neologisms in various la languages. Of course, these are new words related to the pandemic. And uh, for example, you can he hear on the slide new words and uh, uh, dictionary of new words 2020. The, it includes 20 research studies on pragma semantics of the coronavirus neologisms in Russian, uh, English, German, Chinese, uh, Kazakh, and Hungarian languages. I'd like to focus uh, on uh, an article uh, written together by the uh, scientists, researchers from a number of countries. Uh, from uh, Russia, Germany, Spain, and some other countries. So it, it's a very fundamental study. I'm going to talk about the Spanish language. It has a lot of neologisms, but it, uh, they have not been studied well yet. Of course, there are articles on the subject. There are some interviews related to COVID neologisms. But there are a sort of chaotic dictionaries which are not systematized. They just include new words used by the mass media. They are very topical, very relevant for the situation. And these dictionaries are called in Spanish COVID dictionaries. dictionaries. So our study explores into the emotionally colored lexical units. They are expressive because they are emotionally colored. They uh, have a, a connotation of uh, assessment or evaluation. And so we are going to focus not on denotations, but on uh, denotations, but on connotations. And uh, we'll explain, we'll explore into the uh, relations with the cultural realities. The COVID uh, lexical unit in Spanish, uh, of course, are of international char character. For example, you can read this word, COVIDiota, infodemia, corona crisis, coronoia. You can understand that without any translation because they sound practically the same in Russian. And in English, anywhere, it's uh, just, it's international, of course. But there is a layer of Spanish words that are emotionally marked. And we uh, are trying to uh, study the cultural specifics of these emotionally colored evaluative lexical units. And what are the uh, ways of word forming? Uh, one of the most important is blending. Word formation, abbreviation, and blending. There are three of them, but uh, we think that blending is number one. And so there is a huge area for research. 
in terms of uh, studying different types of blending. Uh, as you know, we single out three or four types of it. I'm not going to dwell on it because uh, I am more interested in cultural specifics. So what are the factors that uh, make contributions into the development of new words? They are extra linguistic and linguistics. So the there is use, frequent usage of uh, COVID uh, neologies related to uh, parties and po other political organizations. For example, Vox is a uh, uh, extreme right party. Uh, yeah, so Vox has a specific uh, reputation because it uh, uh, advocates uh, the support of anti-Islamism, it criticizes uh, multiculturalism, it is for the abolition of the um, provinces in Spain. So the, the members of this party are, are, are called bureaucrats in uh, Spanish, bula means uh, uh, fake, crata uh, is clear, uh, bureaucrata. So uh, a new word appeared. And uh, uh, there is um, uh, another interesting expression, starasta coronilla means uh, to be fed up. And coronilla sounds identical to the name of the minister of uh, healthcare. Uh, he's called Iya, and that's why uh, it's uh, the and the pun was created. Senor Mascar Iya, uh, Mascara means mask, and so he now he is called in the press Senor Mascar Iya. Uh, so it's uh, a pun. Uh, uh, based on the similar phonetics, Ilya, Mascarilla, and Karanilla. Another source of neologies are Spanish uh, everyday life uh, and its realities. realities, realities. For example, Sema Semana Santa is the Easter week and it's full of various celebrations or uh, religious celebrations and process processions. Last year, uh, Spain was in a total lockdown. There was no Semana Santa, no uh, Easter celebrations. And now this week is called Semana Manta. Manta means uh, uh, veil, so it means that everything is closed and people do not see each other. And actually, last year, quite often people would only uh, go out to the balconies and express their support of medical personnel. And Manta, uh, there is a, another meaning of this word. It means just uh, looking after people uh, so I've got two minutes left. Uh, let me say a few words about lexical factors. It uh, might, uh, so lexical meaning of a certain words also make makes contribution into the formation of new words. Pan means bread in Spanish. So it sounds identical with pandemic. Pandemiar means, means uh, to hoard bread. Vermu, ver means see. Uh, so again, uh, it's a sort of a pun, uh, play a word uh, uh, as it uh, resembles the word vermut. Uh, another important play is paramiological of language. A layer 
which means uh, idioms and sayings. Uh, you can see the sources. Uh, this slide shows uh, examples of uh, idioms. For example, in April, kilos mil. In April, uh, in April, when you stay at home, you'll gain weight, more kilos. And they, uh, it's uh, this uh, idiom was. Uh, based uh, on the uh, on the uh, saying en abril aguas mil uh, much water in april uh, another interesting example todos los caminos llevan al nevera all ways lead to road to rome again uh, to to the fridge it's based on all all roads lead to rome so thank you uh, I think there are many other sources of uh, Spanish neologism. We just need to uh, study this area, this domain, uh, and uh, the, uh, they are also used to create humoristic effect. So I think that the reason for such a play of words of creating puns is just to relieve the stress and tension which everybody feels uh, during these times of pandemics. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. If there are any questions, you may ask just a question. Hey, you may write it, you may send you may write it in our chat chat thank you very much it was really very interesting when we are through with this pandemic we'll go to spain let's move on the floor is given to valeria burakovska from volgograd state socio-pedagogical university her topic is a quasi-scientific term toxic in the current blogosphere. <laughs> Dear colleagues and friends, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this chance to be here with you. Can you hear me? Natalia Kirillovna, could you switch off the mic, please? Can you see me? No, no presentation. And now, yes, Natalia Kirillna, please switch off the mic. Okay. So, Valeria Anatolia, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, now I'm going to talk about the quasi-scientific term toxic in the current blogosphere. It's based on the Russian and English language samples. As uh, uh, the virtual reality is developing, expanding, and so there are more human interactions in a blogos in blogosphere. We have reached uh, some achievements in many domains, but also there are negative effects because the psychic load is growing and it leads to greater stress. So an efficient tool of uh, the research is an indisciplinary approach that puts together knowledge about human being and knowledge in general. And it will answer the question of uh, the specifics of modern communication. So the word toxic is quite popular and widespread both in Russian and English. Uh, 
So what does it mean? You can hear the story, the background of how this word was was emerged. This this is from the dictionary by Ushakov. So how what is the collocation? Toxic topic, toxic person, toxic asset. So it comes from Latin and Greek. The, uh, the following domains of usage, chemical mascul masculinity, substance, gas, environment, relationship, etc. So the lexicographers found out that the usage of this word toxic relates to work, business, partner, family, relations between relatives, love partners, etc. And it's also used when English speaking people talk about politics. In 2018, this word became the word of the year, according to the expert council on the center of creative development of the Russian language. Oxford lexicographers also singled out this word as the word of the year. So what is the material of our study? Texts of the blogs in Russian, which uh, are focused on the uh, toxicities in the, in the Zen Yandex. So, the level of education is quite high here, though we don't know it exactly. And uh, sometimes texts are written by representatives of medical institutions. The analysis has shown that both in English and in Russian, there are uh, narcissists, manipulators among toxic people. What is the main attribute of a uh, toxic person is to make, to do harm. The toxic partner, partner uh, centers only on his or her own interests. They, they do harm in a deliberate manner. The same content is typical of the English language. The language, uh, uh, the use of the language in both uh, Russian and English languages coincide. There are uh, similar the uh, uh, metaphorical nominations used in the similar way both in English and Russian. For example, um, abuser, savior, etc. In addition to metaphoric nominations, hyperbolic nomination is used. As far as lexical units are concerned, emotionally colored nominations are used. Which means that bloggers want to feel closer to the readers. And sometimes they simplify their ideas using colloquial language. The analysis of the English material sources show that uh, the bloggers uh, come up with very simple decisions or solutions. If you have a contact with a toxic person, just stop seeing him or her. But if it's an official blog of a medical institution, then the language used there 
is more official, though sometimes they also use neutral and colloquial uh, lexical units in a, a simple way for a mass reader. There is also medical term, uh, medi uh, medical ter terms are also used in English blogs. Russian blogs tend to uh, blend or to mix the terms. For example, use the terms from psychology, psychiatry. Though sometimes uh, the uh, bloggers are not well versed in the terms used in the domain of knowledge. Besides that, both English and Russian blogs alike. Strategies and of communication imply that communica communicative interaction, uh, like interaction means that one of the two sides is suffering emotionally or even physically. So the toxic nomination is very popular and that is described by um, scientific knowledge. But nonetheless, there is a lot of work to be done. I've specified uh, the toxicity term and also provided several sources which describe the complexity of the human interaction. One of the discoveries made during this study shows that you cannot combine several communicative aspects aspects in one toxicity a toxic term because there are different sources of such behavior there are several studies not only linguistical but interdisciplinary for example lingual neurobiological studies also underlined five main elements, destructive elements in communication, which you read on the slide. Thank you for your attention. Um, the term toxic right now for the mass audience is a sort of a terminological trap because this word in this context characterized by different meanings. Thank you for your attention. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Indeed, the word toxic became a buzzword recently. Maybe there is a very bright example uh, that will allow people to use this word. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the word toxic or any actually any destructive behavior in communication is described as toxic. But I personally suppose that that is not right, um, because even a hundred years ago, psychiatrists described that negative communication 
was uh, was classified and described, but maybe, well, maybe just in mundane conversations, um, we can derive a specific criteria which will be described as toxic. I agree that that's a metaphor which is very suitable for mundane conversations and that is why it became so popular. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marina Yurevna Avdonyevna and Natalia Ivanovna Jambo and uh, Irina Borisovna Chernyshova. Um, their presentation is variation of the axiological field of Russian borrowing apparatchik in French language media texts. I'm sorry, dear colleagues, but I think that you skipped me. Oh, I am, I am very sorry, Anna Vladimirovna. Thank you uh, for drawing attention to this. Um, so now the floor is yours and your presentation is the multimodal concepts and the contemporary communication of bloggers as a result of their creativity in the internet discourse. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be a participant of the conference. I'll try now to show you my presentations and my slides, and I hope that everything will go smoothly. Is the image clear? Thank you very much. As you can see, I will talk about multimodal concepts in the contemporary communication of bloggers as a result of their creativity in the internet discourse. But we will look closely into uh, multimedia concepts in the blogger sphere. The modal representation of concepts is described by communicative situations. Homsky um, states that any linguistic situation is a nuclear situation and people try to try to summarize the world verbal visual or kinetic uh, so people change different polymodal concepts but polymodality by polymodality we understand simultaneous use of uh, the world world des description we use sign language or verbal language or visual, lang visual language and different people use different communicative channels thus having a very uh, broad set of tools to describe the world around them uh, so the discourse is flooded by different conceptual strategies of communication between different spheres of knowledge. So people use different modes of communication in different um, time spheres. But the current slide shows different polymodal representations of concepts derived from the English blogging discourse. Uh, they are created due to this nucleo um, characteristics. The adorable discourse is being represented by the planned tool. The visual side, uh, the visual side of it represents uh, this strange and bizarre uh, adorable so to say character um, which is then developed into a certain 
um, image. Cinnamon roll is another uh, representational concept that was created for metaphorical change in the base concept and that allows to further influence the emotional state of the recipient. Uh, a cinnamon roll in the image is represented by a cute animal, also barn in English, also a, uh, a roll. And due to this metaphorical changes, uh, a very cute creature is being born. This concept also means that the creature is tender and very vulnerable and you want to defend it because it seems to be too good for this world. This concept may be developed to a frame or script. Another concept in the English discourse, which is in English discourse called special snowflake. In Russian, it has quite a long description in the English discourse. It represents the fact that there are no two identical snowflakes and all of them have, they attract um, a very tender attitude but special snowflake has quite negative connotations because they represent people with uh, very high expectations from others to themselves. And when people uh, are not treated well, they tend to become aggressive and mean. Uh, so this concept, a behavior, a behavior script, which represents a certain um, behavior and reaction to certain situations. The special snowflake concept is a very interesting concept for scientists. Bloggers use it not only with negative connotation, but with a positive one, stating that every human being is special like a snowflake and that's a superpower you can see that in examples below bloggers also through their arguments in polymodal descriptions as provided in this picture uh, in the situation, we can see an image of a snowflake and a phrase. Thank you for uh, you for reminding me of my beauty and uniqueness. Furthermore, this concept is interesting because uh, now it's used in a broader discourse, not only in the internet culture. For example, it is used in media or in a political discourse as well as in different languages, in Russian discourse and in offline discourse. It has both good and bad and negative connotations. You can see examples of this different interpretations of the concept below in my um, slides. Republicans are sometimes being represented as snowflakes, uh, which broadens its meaning and context. Bloggers similarly interpret mass culture. Uh, they state that uniqueness gives you power as well as the consolidations of likely-minded people. 
this intertextual allusion on the Game of Thrones popular TV show, uh, which is evident in the last phrase, winter is coming. This phrase shows that very harsh challenges an eye, and that means that all the snowflakes should come up together. We should pay attention to some grammatical mistake, deliberate mistakes. Um, you can see in flaky phrase. Uh, so such, such a form shows arrogance to the opponents. So the analysis that we've made shows that inter blog, uh, English internet blogging sphere is a fruitful ground for new terms to arise, which helps people to describe the world around them with new logisms. They also have conceptual descriptive tools and describe phenomena inside and outside the uh, internet bloggers here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna Vladimirovna. I want to specify a little thing. Which connotation prevails, negative or positive? I suppose that, that in the beginning, the concept had only a negative connotation, but it's a widespread tendency in the blogosphere, especially while you have you, while you deal with mass media. Um, some negatively accepted phenomena are being used by people with different views. Um, for example, that it's not bad to be different. So the concept start to be interpreted in a different, in a very different way. It's being destroyed and deconstructed, and then it's reassembled with a positive connotation. So this is a never-ending process of different connotations being substituted by one another. It's a never-ending cycle, a very so that is a very adaptive process, right? Yeah, that is correct. That is correct. And you, you may think that there is a concept with uh, a clearly negative connotation, but then somebody has an urge to express um, their opinion, and then they use the, the, uh, a, a concept and give it a different meaning and different connotation. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now I would like to hear um, Marina Afdonina and her presentation on variation of the axiological field of Russian boring apparatchik in French language media text. Anna Vladimirovna, I will just elaborate on your presentation in French. We try to discuss and pay attention to apparatchik. We represent three different universities, the linguistic university, the... So, and we try to see the development of a certain Soviet term 
during the last 10 years, especially in 2020, 2029. And there's been a rapid um, change in its meaning. Some information on our method. We used several French dictionaries which were compiled 20 to 13 years ago. And we tried to analyze different words that have relation to Russia. And now we show you this Sputnik because in our lexicology manuals that we've studied, information that Sputnik is a spacecraft. So you can see that there is a very elaborate and visible change in the meaning. And now Sputnik represent three first um, gadgets that were being sent into space. And it would be fine if, if only French didn't know what Sputnik is, but Russians as well don't really know what this word really means. So we, there is a definition um, of this word from um, a, an article, and you can clearly see that the definition is completely wrong. And the information misinterprets the Sputnik gadget. Well, why did they do this like that? I don't know, but I mean that you we shouldn't we shouldn't really be angry with French people because we ourselves make mistakes. And now the situation in France is such that we can underline certain um, appropriated words, for example, apparatchik that we will discuss today. And there's an evident, evident about the situation this centric uh, attitude in universities and now it's a number one political interest. The Estlinize is a verb describing the fight against um, a very centrist policy. There are terms that have been borrowed from the language. Some of them are usually not originate in, in Russian language. They are also borrowings. Uh, for example, Takamak. It's a not very widespread term, but So there were 26 countries Canada left, Canada left. And this word is against very actively used as with Sputnik. Uh, they tried uh, to promote this uh, name, but it's not used by the Academy of Sciences. It's only used by advertisements. So Fianit is used only by advertisers and there is a di different term for uh, this uh, uh, stone used by the Academy of Sciences. So 
Now let's discuss the word apparatchik, Russian and French. So first there is just a manual worker profession. Uh, and so if we do not take into account the first meaning, the first and the second meaning, the third one is uh, the second meaning uh, is the uh, uh, worker of the party operators and it gives uh, rise to other metaphorical and direct meanings. So with regards to the French language, it borrowed this meaning and apparatchik means the, a member of any party or a trade union. And so it uh, uh, has a, a derogatory meaning in it, connotation. Here on the slide, you can see an example in French. Uh, so uh, Bruno Le, Le Roux, before he was appointed to the post of the Ministry of, or Minister of Interior, uh, saying about himself, uses this word uh, in this quotation. And another important thing is that this uh, theme of luxury uh, that is uh, uh, followed in, that uh, functionaries or apparatchiks follow in, the theme is added by the by some other words such as uh, caviar and here you can see in this example as this word apparatchik is used with the word caviar together in uh, the context they go hand in hand so then let's uh, uh, analyze quality quantity so the number of usages is 200,000 while if we compare it to the Italian language they use it have used it less than 2,000 so you can see that there is a huge difference so French has assimilated this notion For here you can see a uh, the uh, citation of Hillary quoting from Hillary Clinton just uh, apparatchik net and pure but of course it expresses this word expresses a very negative connotation so you have only two minutes left of course I'd like to draw your attention to the following. This word, apparatchik, now moved from the politics to everyday characteristics. For example, here you can see uh, an example that a woman may replace Cardinal Barbamen And so she is not a, a, a new person. She is just a church employee. And another meaning is very experienced, smart, wily. Uh, here is an example. Uh, in this example, this word is used in this meaning. Uh, and so both uh, components of the meaning of both denotation and connotation have changed and uh, an effect of paradox is created so apparatchik is a, uh, a soldier a warrior uh, so the word is so completely assimilated that the singer from Madagascar called himself apparatchik. And uh, 
here are the phrases from the uh, cinema Hotel du Nord. So they used the word atmosphere, atmosphere, didn't understand, without understanding it. The same goes about apparatchik. So what he wants to say, do I look, do I resemble an apparatchik? So you can see that the meanings of the Russian and French words uh, apparatchik are not similar. They do not coincide. So if we translate from French into Russian, we have to find contextual uh, semantic transformations. We have to use transformations to find indirect con correspondences. Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. Marina Igarimna, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Marina Yurevna, so it's a borrowed word, it's a word borrowed from the Russian, it's of frequent usage and it would not disappear from usage, no, especially uh, in the time, at the time of the COVID pandemics, because everybody and is now have, uh, now everybody understands that uh, uh, a uh, good management is of crucial importance. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we're, now we're discussing the issues related to the differences in the world view. Now the floor is to Tatiana Osko and Marina Vikulina, Moscow State Linguistic University. Are you here? Actually, uh, I don't see them. Okay, they are not present. Then the floor is given to Lyudmila Borisovna Boyka. Uh, linguistic and cognitive underpinnings of the formation of superstitions and folk science, a cross-cultural perspective from Immanuel Kant, Baltic Federal University, Russia. So uh, I have not been working in Zoom because we we use a, a different platform. So I'd like to comment on what Marina Yurina was saying. Uh, Marina Yurina, you said that the word the stone, fianit, so zircony is used instead of fianit. But uh, when I, I was young, uh, we called the, the stone fianit. Yes, fianit was used in advertisers and they tried to sell the stone under this name, but they were not successful. There are a lot of semi-precious, precious stones, for example, masanit and our stone, uh, well, this name uh, was not approved. I, I remember how it was created in Termostat in uh, Troitsk, near, it's a small town near Moscow, and they just, he, uh, one of the engineers created this stone. And so it's just applied the uh, uh, area of research, but unfortunately, they stopped use, using this word. Though, thanks to promotion, they used it for some time. At late, uh, and it started, uh, they started to use a different name, Circoni. Okay, so could you help me? Just uh, please press the button, the button screen sharing. 
Ну да, он сначала изначально должен быть у вас открыт на вашем экране. Yeah, it should uh, be open at your screen. I beg your pardon. Oh, okay. Yes, we can see you. So today, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference. It's not the first time I'm here, and I. Uh, I like this conference very much. So today I'm going to talk about linguistic and cognitive underpinnings of the formation of superstitions and folk science in terms of the cross-cultural perspective. So what is it superstition? Uh, I'm not talking about uh, folk science as a result of many years of observation. I'm going to talk about the superstition as an empty face. So uh, it's a sort of a rational conviction that the subject or its circumstances is logically related to the developments, to the evolution of events and they affect the outcomes. So the marketing is focused on uh, uh, studying superstitions. And I am interested in a cognitive aspect or uh, angle of research um, it will compare uh, Russian French German can you see the whole slide or just part of it well we, we can somehow understand what is written though it's too big so this slide shows the data that superstitions are quite widespread. It's just part of any culture. And despite the development of this civilization, technological process, people uh, with high level education still have superstitions. For example, uh, cosmonauts, doctors, and other people, people from other professions. Up to 70% of students uh, believe in angels. And so we are rather surprised by this fact. But if we study our subconsciousness, maybe one, 100% will be, will have superstitions. So what is the nature of superstitions? Of course, it uh, relates to psychic, to psyche, to uh, psychical uh, 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 qualities to perceptions. For example, a human being wants to uh, make a planning to attract good luck. And if he or her is uh, able to fill in the gap in the knowledge through the signs that will show how to behave, what to do to uh, achieve the desired outcomes and synchronicity is also very important synchronicity means uh, just uh, random coincidences 
of fortuitous coincidences. And uh, so filling in the gap creates a custom or a habit that is not controlled by the intellect. So uh, superstitions uh, are involved, evolved into some physical actions, for example, touch wood to shed du bois, the same expression in European languages. And we use it quite extensively, you know, even at uh, our uh, chair or department's meetings. So there are also verbal formulations, for example, break a leg, ni uh, ni pira. And uh, I, I'm not going to pronounce the French word, uh, it's full for, form. And the combination of these two forms. Uh, the superstitions are created through socialization. We're not born knocking on woods, we learn to do so. For example, don't uh, turn uh, uh, the bread. The child will understand, will uh, uh, have it as a habit and it would not, uh, he would not, uh, or she would not uh, uh, subject this uh, recommendation to doubt. It would it becomes a sub a subconscious habit, and there are very uh, various kinds of superstitions. For example, those uh, typical of one culture. For example, French superstition uh, touch the uh, pompon of a, a sailor's beret or the American formula, if you say at, at the beginning of the month, rabbit, 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 you'll have luck this month. So there are, uh, there are also uh, common conceptual uh, domains because we, uh, our civilization is based on common cultural values. And uh, for example, in three uh, cultures, uh, these three cultures, Russian, French, English, have a superstition related to a spider. Num there are numerological superstitions. There, of course, different figures bring luck or bring bad luck, but still there are superstitions related to numbers. So uh, these superstitions are based on different conceptual uh, explanations and have different interpreta interpretations. So uh, uh, bread and butter, it's a very old English saying, if we want uh, to, to have good luck. We also are not separated by the lamppost, but if we do, we do not have such a ritual and we would not say such words, bread and butter. But if we are separated by something, it's also a sign of bad luck in Russian. What is uh, the, the structure of superstition about a maggot? Magpie, magpie. So the uh, mag uh, tie tail, if it's long, it has a long tail. It talks too much, and uh, the bird lives in couples. And so you can see there are Russian sayings with this word so the tale is the reason for all the events 
Uh, magpie talks too much. And there is a saying in Russian, Saroka Sakochin Gaste Prarochit. It means that uh, a magpie will, uh, through talking, will bring guests to our house. Uh, English. This lot uh, is active, uh, shows that uh, it's, uh, this bird lives in couples, one for sorrow, two for mirth, three for wedding, and four for death. In French culture, if you see only one magpie, it's for bad luck. But it's bad luck if it's it's one. So, but you can uh, dry away bad luck in English if you come across just one magpie. You, you should say good morning, General, or good morning, Captain. And you should ask such a question. So the model, our speech behavior is not uh, used neither in Russian nor in French, because we do not see a magpie in Russian as a bird living in couples. And by the way, I read about the Chinese culture and the uh, main component of the frame magpie in Chinese is also the fact that it lives in couples. And so it's very interesting, uh, uh, and it's it's really a curious fact. Okay, I won't uh, talk more. Uh, now I'll just make a conclusions. So these superstitions show that we focus our cognitive attention in a different way. Uh, there are some specific reasons for this, but. Uh, practical conclusions are imp important. For example, if uh, in intercultural communication uh, you do not know these models of superstitions, it means that he is or she is not a native speaker. So it's very important uh, to learn these models uh, because it helps to improve the level of acquisition of the models of cross-cultural communication in general so because it's a it's a sort of lingua cultural idioms because they have a verbal non-verbal components that's why that's why they resemble the uh, lingua specific idiom so thank you i i'm ready to ask you to answer your questions please Do you think that um, these originate from a religious um, conscience? There is a whole separate sphere of uh, scientific knowledge and su religious superstitions uh, cross breed and intersect. There are, there are pagan ones and Christian ones. The, 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 that's a separate field of work because that is also a, a belief in something um, unnatural. And I was interested in the lingua cognitive aspect of it, but that is a very interesting and important question. And if you compare a child's cognition and an adult's cognition. Because I always thought that this um, hands legs uh, tend to be uh, tend to be uh, a child's uh, more of a child's um, conscious. But that is 
a Christian. The, this triangular shape is a triangle. Uh, is a Christian symbol. And in other um, cultures, there is the same belief that you shouldn't go under a triangular shape. Well, of course, they are somewhat childish. Or adults impose them on their children. Well, some adults really impose them, but um, in general, all these prejudices come from socialization. Just like we discover language and we learn a certain language. This ethnographic field of knowledge is very important right now. And the Hong Kong University now has a new publication on on uh, ethnographic aspect of translation, and that is a very topical issue. And do marketologists uh, fear anything? Well, of course, because buyers and clients have their own fears and prejudices and marketologists are afraid of them they try to um, they try not to deal with them but i always thought that marketing is a scientific field and they should um, believe in science not in prejudices well in theory yes but uh, in practice we have to deal with all these prejudices our next speaker is Nguyen Thithan Hill with his presentation on the arrogance cognitive scenario. Uh, can you say clearly? Hello, and good afternoon to all. All your colleagues and I would like to talk about the arrogance cognitive scenario and its representation in Russian and Vietnamese languages. In cognitive linguistics, gestalt, gestalt frame and scenario are three pillars. Uh, the first one is the bind and synthesize image which includes emotional and rational elements as well as dynamic and static aspects of re objects representation frame is a uh, probably the most important aspect of cognitive linguistics. It's a multi-layered concept, which represents a typical situation. Scenario in cognitive linguistics is a structure that produces stereotypes uh, about different situations or about stereotypical behavior. And um, there are other um, meanings of this term coined by different scientists. This presentation is centered on the arrogance scenario in Russian and Vietnamese. And it centers on description of these two cognitive scenarios. The dictionary meaning of arrogance characterizes such behavior as uh, feeling superior to other people, 
and it's used in philosophy, linguistics, psychology, psychiatry, so on and so forth. In the psychology, this term relates to narcissism and uh, it represents psychological fragility and vulnerability. Arrogance in psychology represents um, well, arrogance. In Oshagov and Shvedov dictionary, arrogance means mean um, behavior. And Yefremova describes it as a feel of superiority. And as well, mean, and cruel behavior towards others. So we compare arrogance in Russian with Vietnamese description. So there are some differences and some similarities. In Vietnamese, arrogance can be um, manifested in two forms. The first one uses an, a particle in the beginning. And the, the second one is and the tank particle are used as a with um, particle Vietnamese dictionaries described to tell or arrogance as a overestimation of yourself and another dictionary describes arrogance as a state of over evaluation of oneself in russian it describes behavior but of, of a certain person but in vietnamese it doesn't nominate it doesn't have this nominative aspect it just describes a certain um, behavioral pattern. In Russian, arrogance is manifested in several um, verbs, as well as in Vietnamese. In Russian, it's to bolster yourself, to um, throw dust on the eyes, but in uh, Vietnamese, there is a uh, saying to uh, take the sky as a lid, which also represents arrogance. In Vietnamese, arrogance is usually manifested in verbal phraseologisms like to um, turn up your face or to look arrogant. Arrogance is a multi-discursive term and we have two specific um, language groups, both in Russian and Vietnamese. The first one represent arrogance in situations when you want to create a certain appearance or a certain image. Uh, so there is an example. Stepan sit down to speak with a con and uh, put out a saber and began to, uh, and, and he was arrogant. But there's another example in Vietnamese, and uh, a similar a similar phrase has a, quite a different meaning. 
and uh, in Vietnamese it has a slightly different uh, meaning and connotation. In both languages, people don't like when people act arrogant, but in Vietnamese there is a hidden semantic aspect. Uh, arrogance is a bit more acceptable. The second group uh, is related to nonverbal communication and reactions. And uh, let's look into the uh, national language corpus. And then this actor began to uh, devilishly uh, behave himself, but he stopped to uh, behave badly. So the second group um, represents a very similar reaction in both languages. And uh, bragging has uh, as a cognitive scenario is um, a more uh, condescending, has a more condescending attitude. So that is, that is it. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? I have a question, may I? In the Russian lingua culture, arrogance and bragging is uh, not welcomed because of Christianity and in Vietnamese culture, why arrogance is a bad characteristic. Are there any, um, are there any sources uh, of this rejection? In Vietnamese language, arrogance is considered bad, but there is a hidden semantic aspect uh, to to take it as, as good behavior, but why it, it, is it considered bad? What is the source of such an attitude towards arrogance and bragging in uh, the Vietnamese culture? A Vietnamese person, arrogance. It's a behavior when people overestimate themselves and and when people do not respect others and believe that others are worse and you are the best one basically all right thank you I, I guess there are some, these are some basic and widespread human principles. Um, may I also ask a question? Uh, situations when a, a certain person tries to represent himself as uh, not an arrogant person, but others consider him bragging about something because I interviewed um, an American when I was doing a research about Mayflower Americans or May Mayflower family. These are people that came to America 100 years ago and they were quite and they were quite had a, they had a good life, but and had they had a good, good education. But what do you think that Mayfa American arrogant? Are you arrogant? And she said no. 
No, I am not an arrogant person. We are just, we are the, but we are the best. That is a fact. These people don't notice their arrogance. Is there such a context in Vietnamese culture? Um, no, I th we don't really have such a context, but certainly there are such people present in any culture. Thank you very much. And we have one more presentation. Marina Chernyshova. About what's good and what's bad in Russian and Ukrainian cognitive analysis. Person, can you turn on your microphone? And do you need to um, share your screen? Так, остальные коллеги, пожалуйста, выключите. What can they ask other participants to turn off their microphones? I would like to begin with a third matrix. Next slide, please. In the linguistic worldview is verbalized in, in the language and it represents uh, knowledge accumulated by certain culture. Elena Borisovna, is it possible to turn up your volume a little bit? We can't really hear you. Thank you. The most appropriate analysis strategy is to specify uh, a core and uh, associative verbal system is also a very um, important term now presentation and this verbal net embodies a verbal and associative um, row of different terms. Lev Nikolaevich Karaulov states that verbal communication of different verbal nets can give us an understanding of a worldview of a certain uh, mindset. And he coined a term evaluative, associative, dominant, which represents this core of associative connections in a verbal net. So it describes this good and bad connotations in the Russian and Ukrainian languages. Then we have certain materials, for example, the Slavic associative dictionary, and we've analyzed 1,600 reactions and uh, linguistic units. And we've noticed that this dictionaries compile certain linguistic reactions and associative fields accumulate those associations and range them in a certain order. Uh, 
while this units containing knowledge uh, about a world around us then creates a certain linguistic um, gestalt. There is also an interesting aspect of the systems because they cut out certain associations and they create somewhat of a canonic um, set of associations. It's semantic gestalt, gestalt in Russian language modulates an associative field uh, regarding the connotation of good And even though Russian and Ukrainian language have a lot of common characteristics regarding the connotation of good, we still have certain differences. And there are four distinct distinctive areas uh, in which we can compare the connotation of good in Russian and Ukrainian. So we can see that the quantitative analysis shows differences in the sub zones. As you can see in the table on the slide, the first sub zone is the same for the Russian and Ukrainian language, but the second subzone is much less frequent in Russian than in Ukrainian. While the third subzone is somewhat, uh, somewhat the same in both languages. If we try to create a digital model, of a semantic field of bad, we can see the structural similarities. The number of Gestalt zones in both languages is quite similar. And it's also proven by a more widespread use of uh, bad connotations in both languages. The quantitative analysis of different aspects of this gestalt is also proven to be similar in both languages. And we can see that evaluative expressions interpret this concept uh, differently in, uh, in two cultures. So what is good or bad in uh, consciousness of these two cultures? In Russian, good is connected with something you do for example if you work or you sleep leave or study something we we'll have similar connotations in ukraine also in uh, the ukrainian culture we have this emotional connection with the notion of good. Uh, so what about bad? In, in the Russian, we have a certain amount of ambivalence because same verbs, same notions can be considered bad. But we have some similarities between two cultures. For example, it's in both languages, it's bad to be sick or to lie to somebody or to 
act uh, in a bad manner. So, we can make a conclusion that this associative gestalt in two languages, these two connotations, good and bad, is shown in the language, language's structure and its uh, evaluative um, words. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Elena Borisovna. Now it's time to ask questions if you have any. May I ask a question? Thank you for your presentation. Maybe I've missed something because there, there were some technical issues. Are there any any aspects that m make these two cultures different regarding this connotation of good and bad? But the difference um, is not that big, actually, in, in, in both cultures. Uh, the difference is in quantity, basically. And we can register this quantitative differences in Russian language and uh, Ukrainian language. There is the same understanding of these concepts, but but in Russian, we use um, such concepts as lie less frequent. Thank you. I also have a question. Thank you, Lena Berisovna, for your presentation. As, as a general, the uh, linguistic mindset is usually connected with the native language. But as far as we discuss bilingual situations, I assume, or I rather wonder, um, if we can discuss this concept in a bilingual situation. No, I, my question is whether we can differentiate these notions into cultures and how is it different from a bilingual mindset, bilingual worldview. Maybe there are certain um, differences or uh, some specific details uh, in such a situation. The thing is that my presentation showed that inside different regions of Russia, uh, there's actually no separation between uh, these two concepts, and there is not much of a difference in understanding of these two concepts. But if we would compare it uh, with some articles in this Slavic uh, dictionary, we will notice that in a, in a broader context, differences are more apparent. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yelena Borisovna, once again. 
This was the last presentation for today. The last but not least, of course. Dear colleagues, are there any comments regarding today's session? Uh, I would like to thank you for having me, and I would like to thank our hosts for the hard work regarding the organization of this conference. Thank you very much. It is pleasing to have such conversations because we are somewhat confined right now. Dear colleagues, I was only a listener and I like to express Thanks to you, to you all, and for a very high level of speakers and organization in general. Thank you. Lyudmila Borisovna, you wanted to just say something? No, this was just my applause for, for, for everybody. That's why I forgot how to raise a hand in Zoom, actually. It's very good to have such a deep conversation. Надежда Брачикова, the floor is yours. I know that we have time limits, but it would be great if speakers had a little bit more time. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time and uh, we have certain limitations that is a typical issue. But we always try to strike a balance. Sometimes we can do that, sometimes we, we fail to do that. But anyway, I hope that everyone enjoyed today's session, and there is more to come. Thank you all for attendance and participation in this conference, and I hope to see you soon during the second day of our conference. And I'm certain that the second day of our conference will be interesting and deep as well. And we will discuss differences in different languages. Thank you very much for your attention.